Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 883. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm David Pelegi. And today is October 2nd, 2024. All right, I'd like to welcome the audience to a special program of Anglican Unscripted, and we're going to be talking about some very heavy issues. I have David Paligi with me from uh, Jerusalem, and I don't want to give you your exact location because we're on the cusp of war, and uh, I'm imagining you and your neighbors uh, spent some time uh, last night uh, in bomb shelters or uh, hidden from uh, just the savages of what's going on. Uh, you've been on this program before. You were on a couple weeks ago when we talked about kind of this coming war and uh, what what is the Middle East going through. And I want to set this program up with no time limit. We can go 10 minutes, half hour, an hour, whatever it takes to really get the feeling of how to enlighten the Western mind to how people in the Middle East think their spirituality and their leadership and a whole bunch of topics uh before we get to that uh david how are you how are you and your family doing oh, our um our family is well um our, our congregation is well we we had uh, a missile fall maybe 30 or 40 yards from uh one of our one of the homes of our parishioners, and uh, he is in uh, shock, along with his along with his wife. But uh, otherwise, uh, we are doing well, and uh, it's important, I guess, for your listeners to know that uh, we we have a number of parishioners uh, in the Israeli Defense Forces, and at the same time, we have par- parishioners who are Palestinians who are living in Bethlehem and uh, other places and of course they have struggles uh, similar to ours but actually a little bit different so it's a sort of unique congregation and to minister to uh, folks who are both israelis and arabs uh, is sometimes quite challenging mm-hmm. well and we're going to talk a little bit about the mindset mm-hmm. of of a Middle Easterner, for all better purposes, an, an Arab or a Jew. Um, let's go back in time and talk about October 6th, the day before terrorism uh, struck uh, Israel. And we've always struggled bringing peace negotiations between uh, Arab states in Israel or the PLO or uh, Palestine or uh, Hamas or Hezbollah. But time itself was kind of that negotiation. And at the time of October 6th, I think there were five or six countries um, in the Middle East who had come to some type of treaty or peace peace arrangement with Israel. I'm thinking of Egypt. They did that in 1979. Jordan, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia was going to be next up. Uh, peace mm-hmm. was slowly coming, um, very slow in, in terms of uh, our Western eyes, but mm-hmm. it, it was on. It was almost on the cusp. Like we're on the cusp of war now. Peace was on the cusp. October six. What on earth changed all that? Well, it was, as you say. On one hand, there was a, a growing uh, rapprochement between the Sunni Arab countries and Israel. Mm -hmm. I think this was in large part thanks to the Iranian threat. But at the same time, there was something missing in all this formula. And that was the national aspirations of the Palestinians. And so we could, and hopefully will in the future, have uh, peace with Saudi Arabia and peace with uh, other Arab states. But the, the the, one of the key issues is the Palestinian issue, and of course nobody was r- willing to address it. The Saudis didn't really want anything to do with it. Uh, the Gulf states are uh, worn out by the Palestinian issue, and 
in, in, a, in a sense, um, have some hostility toward the Palestinians uh, themselves. Uh, Israel internally is stuck politically. People don't know what to do with the with the Palestinians or with 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 the territories that were conquered after 1967. Should we keep them? Should we give them back? And you, there's no movement. And regarding the Palestinian issue, there's no in game, right? Uh, at least no in game in sight. And so you had. Uh, Mr. Sinwar in Gaza, who decided that uh, on October the 7th that he would strike a blow uh, against Israel. He apparently, according to, to those uh, Israelis who knew him well, because he served a fair amount of time in Israeli prisons, and uh, he, was, quote, in, he was interrogated. Uh, and by that I mean uh, his um, his jailers had long, long uh, discussions with him about his philosophy. They came to understand his personality. They they knew him, uh, when he was in Israeli prisons that he was quite important, and so they have quite a file and they built up uh, a profile on him. But Mr. Sinwar uh, became uh, something of uh, a megalomaniac. He, in a religious sense, he began to think of himself as someone who's very important, who was going to bring about uh, the destruction of Israel, the end of Israel. And here, Kevin, we need to be really clear. He has no interest in, uh, quote unquote, ending the occupation. He doesn't uh, care about a two-state solution. He does want the territory from the river to the sea and he wants it to be a state under Sharia, he wants it to be an Islamic state. He, he believes, like many other Muslims, not all of them, but many, that uh, Israel simply has no right to exist uh, from, from an Islamic point of view. And so he launched the terrorist attack on October, October the 7th. He was under the impression or the illusion that somehow Israel would collapse. And he was further under the illusion that Hezbollah was going to join him along with the Shiite militias in Iraq, the Houthis in Yemen, and it would be a matter of weeks before the whole state of Israel would be finished. Well, in his, again, his megalomania or in his euphoria, religious messianic euphoria, he forgot to, or purposely didn't tell Hezbollah that he was planning on uh, this attack on, the, on October the 7th. So while he shot Israel to its core, uh, of course, he, he failed. Uh, he failed completely and he brought, he has brought uh, upon himself and upon the people of Gaza and the most uh, horrific uh, destruction uh, imaginable. I have no idea who's going to rebuild Gaza and who's going to who's going to to pay for it. And so, even though he failed to coordinate with Iran and with Hezbollah, uh, he his activities, of course, have you might say activated or engaged the the ring of fire. Yes, the mm -hmm. uh, the Iranian uh, proxies. Uh, the, uh, that surround Israel and Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Yemen. And uh, now we find ourselves uh, in a war uh, with, um, with Iran itself. Uh, this has started, started in Gaza. It went to Lebanon, uh, which from Israel's point of view was uh, somewhat understandable that uh, Hezbollah needed to be pushed back from its border. But now uh, the events last night um, pretty much conclude uh, that we are in a regional war. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the implications of this uh, on one hand are very dangerous. On the other hand, this could lead to <clears throat> something of a realignment in the Middle East uh, with Iran being uh, humiliated or its influence being diminished. And that peace process between Israel and uh, and uh, the other 
uh, Arab states, at least the Sunni states, would continue. Um, the Sunni states, such as Saudi Arabia, even though they may not care for the care very much for the Palestinians or worry too much about Palestinian suffering, uh, at least in public, they cannot be seen to be callous towards the Palestinians. So they can't. Uh, carry on with uh, some kind of recognition, uh, even semi-official recognition of Israel while Israel is uh, at war, still at war in the Gaza Strip. So all of that has been all of that has been put on hold. And again, at the end of the day, somehow Israelis and Palestinians are going to have to reckon with themselves and come to some kind of arrangement. I know both of them would really love to just ignore each other and somehow um, win the war, so to speak, yes, by creating facts on the ground. You have, a, you have groups in Israel and within the Israeli government that believe the solution is simply to build more settlements and more settlements and more settlements, yes, and you have Palestinians who believe we don't really need to compromise with Israel, we will simply uh, use our influence to ostracize the Jewish state. We will accuse them of apartheid. Soon there will be trade embargoes, arms embargoes. Uh, Israel will become the new South Africa, and we'll get what we want without compromise. And, and that's at the heart of what's happening at the moment. The mindset of a leader in the Middle East is much like here in the West, although there is, in in from my observations, a great desire never to be seen uh, weak in the eyes of their citizenship. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, they can't back down. So if mm -hmm. you're ramping up to war, there really is no way to back out for a Arab state leader. Um, mm -hmm. And this is just kind of that, we call it here in America, saber rattling. You know, which, you know, once it starts rattling and it gets louder and louder, boom, you find yourself in a, a conflict and a war. And we seem to be here. Tell me a, bit, a little bit about the, the, the Middle East mindset when it comes to not being able to back down, not being able to apologize, not to be able to say I'm sorry or admit wrong. Well, um, or if I'm, the, if I'm the, completely the, off here, you could tell me no, that too. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I want to be careful that I don't end up uh, being uh, tasered and uh, crucified for uh, overgeneralization. Okay. Um, but let's say this. I can say from my experience that um, one of the great fears that is shared culturally across the region uh, is this worry about chaos, okay? Mm -hmm. Chaos. Um, this becomes, you might say, the enemy, certainly the enemy of, uh, of every society. And the formula seems to be that um, if you're weak, certainly in the way that you respond, uh, especially to aggression, you will invite uh, more aggression, now, is this always true? It's not always true. But I would say that uh, in many places across this region, and, and even in some places, quarters within Israel, this is the standard formula. And there, there's a, a long history to, 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 you might say, to prove uh, that, that the formula is not, uh, or is not necessarily wrong. So um, you often hear... Uh, in the news media or on blogs or, or you, uh, I hear people who come and, and they say something like the following, well, you know, the Middle East is an eye for an eye and it's a tooth for a tooth and, uh, you know, there'll, there'll never be peace there or there'll never be stability. It's always it's been like that for, you know, for a thousand years. And I think people say this because they find it very complicated and they don't know what to do, or they don't want to get involved uh, in one way or another. So to say it's it's impossible, and it's been like this for a thousand or two thousand years. People say it's been like this since uh, since the time of Jesus. Maybe let's uh, let's us uh, 
off the hook. But this eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth uh, sounds like, well, somebody wants revenge. But basically, the way people understand, the way leaders, uh, elites uh, understand that uh, this region works, which, by the way, isn't much different than uh, the way uh, other uh, military men or politicians or elites in other countries think. Perhaps it's a little, a little more naked here. It's a little more raw, uh, a little less subtle, is that if somebody attacks you, if somebody uh, pushes against you, if you don't show uh, uh, re either resilience or resistance, uh, you're, in, you're inviting more violence. Uh, and subsequently, you'll end up inviting, you'll inviting chaos. So therefore, um, the way the, this region works is that uh, if you're attacked, you know, you better, it, they always use the word retaliate. It, it, especially, I think in Israel's case, it's not a question of retaliation. It's a question of, of deterrence. And one of the things that led to Israel's, uh, led to October the 7th was this understanding by Hezbollah and Hamas that Israel had become weak, that uh, Israel was internally divided, uh, which it was. Uh, the, the year before October the 7th, there's a huge amount of the internal dissent in Israel over uh, some government reforms being proposed by uh, Mr. Netanyahu, uh, that the Israeli army um, uh, was, at least the, the, Israel, the ground forces of the Israeli army were rusty and somehow uh, not ready, and therefore we can and should uh, take advantage uh, of, of this situation. And so with the loss of Israeli and deterrence, it actually invited more, it actually invited more, more violence. So I think these are the sort of things that hopefully that, uh, you know, we can uh, keep in mind. Now, it, the conundrum is if you have to use force, how much force, what kind of force, when you use force, uh, it's, it certainly has to be used, uh, it has to be used wisely. And uh, we, we have a, a lot of experience with this on the micro level, on the, uh, you might say, on the neighborhood level. Um, we, we've had arguments, disagreements with neighbors uh, in which they used uh, violence against us. And so how do we respond as Christians, right? How do we respond uh, to, to, to such things, um, to either violence, theft, vandalism uh, by folks who are living around Christchurch, uh, many of them who were, many of are Arab Christians. And how do we live out the teachings of Jesus, right? You turn the other cheek, uh, you don't know, respond to your enemy. Are we uh, living through, uh, by Romans or Romans 12? When we know that putting up, uh, you know, strong borders, strong boundaries, somehow uh, will bring this to an end. And, you know, it's very challenging, uh, certainly very challenging to us. And again, I we can see it on a on a neighbor to neighbor basis. And, and it's very easy or not difficult to see how it extends from one ethnic group to another or one, uh, uh, or one nation to another. So how did we solve this, this very sticky, sticky problem? Well, we just began to pray, uh, you know, that the Lord would somehow go to battle for us. And uh, it turned out that the, the neighbors who were uh, causing us a lot of issues and many problems, um, they uh, they had a change of heart uh, because we were no longer their enemy, but there's another rule that certainly uh, might be the number one rule of, of the Middle East or the number one principle is that the enemy of my enemy is my 
is my friend. And mm -hmm. so there was a, a change in uh, some of the, the, the local monasteries and all of a sudden uh, the, um, some of the monks became, had started to they had problems with our neighbors, so all of a sudden our neighbors became our friends. And we we solved it basically not by resorting to force, but by you know, resorting to uh, prayer and fasting. Now, uh, a, a nation, I don't know if it can necessarily, you know, necessarily do that. And any nation that does not um, uh, care for the, the, you might say, the security of its citizens, or any government doesn't care for the security of its citizens, really is not worthy of being called a government. So we, we, we do have this, um, we do have a certain dynamic again in the Middle East. Uh, I, uh, it, it is very prominent here. And as I said, it might be a bit more raw, a bit more uh, observable than it, it, it is, for example, in, in Washington, D.C., because when the Iranians or somebody does something to us, we certainly, uh, we eventually push back against them. So um, there is, you know, this understanding, unfortunately, right, that force works. And in Israel, there's also kind of a, there's a saying if force doesn't work, use more force. Yeah. Right? There's Israel's a, and after a hundred years of war um, with his neighbors uh, has become, uh, you might say, somewhat, somewhat jaded, and uh, it, it uh, has its, you might say, its own rules. Israel's in part Western, and, and yet at the same time, it uh, it understands not always, but generally understands the, the, the way the Middle East plays its plays plays the game, and it is tries to to respond in a you might say in a like uh, in a like manner. Um, so, well, right now, Iran is Israel's biggest foe. That's right. Uh, okay. And let's talk a little bit about Iranian history. I mean, the U.S. had its wake-up call uh, in the late 70s, 1970s, with the Iranian uh, hostage crisis. Um, That's when right. Iran uh, took uh, hundreds of uh, American hostage uh, from the embassy, and uh, this played out over a year, year and a half. Um, negotiations were attempted. Uh, President Jimmy Carter at the time didn't know what to do. He, there's, how do you deal with the mindset of a revolution at the time uh, in Iran? How do you deal with the mindset of the youth of Iran at the time who were all in favor of this revolution? And we were, well, we were, we were dumbfounded. I, we, exactly. We were dumbfounded. And when it comes to the Middle East, we're naive. Mm -hmm. We're very, very naive. We uh, thought that somehow... Yes, that the uh, revolution against the Shah was, you know, because uh, you 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 had people protesting the price of melons, right, in the market, uh, the market in Tehran. And what yeah. we failed to understand is that we basically failed to understand Islam. We're more or less secular. Yeah, the, those who make policy for us, those <clears throat> in our military, they don't. Uh, understand uh, the way religious people think or the way m Muslims might think or, or, or you might say uh, Muslim revivalist or, or Muslim, um, those who, who want to uh, renew uh, Islam, we would call them radical Muslims or we have different, uh, different names for them and, and by, I'm not necessarily saying all Muslims are like this, but uh, Again, because we think on a very secular level, but people here, even if there's even even if they're secular, and I can include many Jews, think theologically, right? They think religiously, even if they're not really personally re religiously observant. Yes, and so we we miss that. We 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 don't understand. So instead of backing Iran down in the beginning because of a, either our ignorance 
or are also uh, this right American isolationism. We don't want to get involved. We don't want to tangle with the Iranians. There's not any need to do so. We w basically what happens is we end up becoming enablers and we enable and we enable and we enable. And like many democracies, we don't want to solve a tough problem until the, until the last minute. And when we go to solve the problem, it becomes a lot costlier and more complicated, right? Um, had we, you know, we dealt with it, uh, dealt with it in the beginning. And this has been our our relationship with the Iranians, I think, uh, for you know, for 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 quite some time. They are an implacable enemy of the United States. They want to push the West and um, the United States out of the Middle East. Uh, they want to bring about the destruction of Israel. And they want to have, you know, kind of a Shiite uh, Islamic hegemony uh, over this uh, uh, over this entire region. And I, what I'm afraid of is that uh, American isolationism uh, and this desire uh, that I don't want to get involved anymore in the Middle East. It's again, it's too complicated. It's too costly. Uh, and unfortunately, when people say those things, they cite you know, the example of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I say unfortunately because I also agree those are wars that lasted too long. Um, and I, I think, Kevin, this is really, really dangerous, right? Again, American, uh, a kind of a, a theological religious uh, ignorance uh, on top of uh, the, the popular sentiment that we have in the United States to want to um, become isolationist. And whether it's in Europe or the Pacific or the Middle East, right, the United States plays an incredibly important role in world stability. And uh, the world would be a much, a much more dangerous place. Um, and, and that danger actually will, will f fall, will uh, fall, uh, fall out. Uh, will be dangerous for the United States. Well, and Israel, the world will I mean, be you be the casualty of it, yeah. yeah, will be a much more dangerous place, huh. right, if we do not hold the course, yes, and uh, provide wise, stable leadership. Because if okay. we don't do it, it, right, there's nobody else in, in this region or in Europe or the Pacific who, who will, um, who has, actually who has the ability to do it. Okay. No, nobody is willing to hold Iran uh, accountable. Absolutely, but in that exists what we call a vacuum or a void, when there's a lack of leadership shown by a superpower like the United States, uh, which is currently the only superpower operating right now. Um, the quickest people to realize that there's a vacuum and a void is Iran. That's you know, they, oh, they're like, wait a minute. We, we were over here pushing somebody's button and nobody came over here to tell us to stop it. We're bullying uh, uh, Israel and nobody's telling us to stop it. Well, we're going to keep doing it. And mm -hmm. we've, you know, Jimmy Carter's administration was a perfect example. Uh, you know, the re revolution occurred under the watchful eye of America and America who did not know what to do because there was that void of leadership uh of how we how to fight a war we've not won a war since uh uh world war ii you know mm -hmm. and i think the the world is starting to, to pay attention uh what happens when we have different leadership in in the presidential offices here in america mm -hmm. uh, and uh iran yeah. is going to be very uh wise to that um in, in a spiritual sense where do well let's back before we get to that um and talk about assets right now i would say that the greatest asset israel has in a time of conflict is the Mossad. i um I, no. yeah israel has israel has uh it has very uh good uh 
it has two or three very good intelligence services. Mm -hmm. um, those uh, those uh, services have performed exceedingly well um, in their um, in Israel's war against Hezbollah and Iran to date. Uh, but of course, you, you know they're they're limited. Um, Israel has a very strong air force, and last night we. Uh, I think more or less knocked down 180, maybe not quite 181 Iranian missiles. Um, maybe a few got through, but we had help from the United States and Great Britain. So uh, you know, Israel has a has a strong army, a strong uh, a, a strong uh, anti-missile defense system, but still facing Iran. Um, facing Iran in a full-scale war would be would be extremely extremely difficult mm -hmm. and um, again we're on the cusp of a regional war that war might turn out to be uh, an opportunity to reshape the Middle East with a with an Iran that has become you might say humbled and uh, much more cautious or it might, you know, lead to lead to a disaster in which the United States will have no choice but uh, but to get involved. You might um, think of a scenario where Iran uh, sends uh, thousands of troops, or th tens of thousands of troops, yes, through Iraq, um, maybe even disrupting Jordan. Uh, to Lebanon, to uh, to Syria, I'm not sure, quite sure how Israel, uh, you know, would deal with uh, certainly would deal with uh, such a scenario. So that's one whole thing. Secondly, um, if there is a war against Israel and Iran, and even if Iran, you might say, has its wings clipped. Or, or Iran is forced into a stalemate or it's humiliated in one way or another, they will institute a wave of terror against uh, Jewish and Israeli targets and possibly against Americans and, and other Westerners Absolutely. for years to come. Mm -hmm. there, there, there will be hell to pay for, for, for years to come. And I think Israel, I hope Israel will be wise enough to know uh, when it must engage Iran, uh, whether it has no choice or not, uh, and when it uh, actually, when it should uh, pull back from, from the brink. Um, and s spiritually speaking, I think people, I, I think all of us need to be praying. Uh, I've said this before, I think every time I've been on your program, I love the Anglican liturgy, I love the prayers of the people, but that's not enough, right? People who are believers, uh, those who have especially a gift of intercession. We need to be in our prayer closets. Mm -hmm. We need to be fasting and praying and asking the Lord to not only reveal his will, but also to um, pull down those strongholds of wickedness and, and, and evil uh, in, this, in this part of the world. Uh, and also, I, I, we hope and pray that this will be, you know, spiritually a wake-up call for for Israel uh, and the Jewish people, sort of like Joseph and his brothers, right? What you know, Joseph at, at the climax of that story in Genesis, he reveals himself to his brothers and he says, "What you meant for evil, God meant for good." And I know it's very hard as we come up to the uh, anniversary of October the seventh, um, because those events on that day, Kevin, uh, there should be no mistake. Yes, this is not propaganda. This no one's. This is not fake news. Yes, the 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 terrorism and the horror of things that occurred on that day. Yes, uh, they're virtually unspeakable. Yeah, you you can't even talk about uh, them. Pro you know, without uh, without becoming. Uh, either depressed or even even nauseated. So it's hard to speak about or hard to say, and I want to say it glibly, but our prayer is that 
God somehow over time will turn this around, you know, for good, uh, spiritually good for the Jewish people, uh, good for, for Arabs, uh, good that perhaps those who um, put their faith in a resurgent Islam, right, uh, will see that, uh, you know, that uh, that's, not, that's not the solution. And, uh, you know, that vision uh, of Isaiah 19 where um, Assyria, Egypt, and Israel, right, uh, will be connected together by the worship of the one true God yeah. will, will be a blessing in all the earth, right? I think that's a potential. And we don't have to say it'll never happen, it'll never happen, it, it won't happen in my lifetime. That's a pessimism. Uh, and uh, we're, I think we're, uh, we're limiting God. We've well, already we, seen. Yeah, we are, li we are limit. Well, we are limiting because on October 6, twenty twenty three, there was a possibility. It was mm -hmm. something that was, uh, by time, God's greatest mm -hmm. gift achievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it was. Yes, it was we were. Yeah. We were moving towards, we were moving, I, I mentioned that, you know, that there, there was a, uh, you might say, uh, a reluctance, a refusal to solve the Palestinian problem, but on so many other levels, it was very positive. Yeah. It, it, was, it, was, it was very positive, it was very hopeful. Um, we're always praying that Israel will be a light to its neighbors, a blessing uh, to its neighbors, and we hope and pray that uh, the neighbors in this region uh, will be, you know, a, a mutual blessing to to the Jewish people, and at the end, that uh, God would get the glory out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we're moments away from Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, twenty-five days of fasting. A day of atonement. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I you know, certainly welcome uh, the the audience to to help uh, partake of this as well. How can we incorporate that into a, a, a prayer where we have atonement to ourselves, but we pray for Israel? And pray well, for um, I think uh, it's it's really important to um, establish a few of the principles uh, first. Um, uh, I don't think they'll be too strange or unfamiliar uh, mm -hmm. to to Anglicans. Um, first, I, the, I think what's really important, and we spoke about this earlier, right, about culture uh, in the Middle East, is that within Jewish culture, um, there is uh, this uh, ability uh, to reflect uh, upon uh, one's life uh, and to ask for forgiveness, to confess, uh, to repent, uh, and to uh, change one's uh, actions or one's, uh, one's lifestyle. And that um, ability to say, I'm wrong, I've, I've, I've committed a sin, uh, is something that's missing in many places in the Middle East. Uh, we have this culture that lives by, you might say, the principle to admit a mistake is to make a second mistake. Mm -hmm. You do not want to admit that you've done something wrong. Instead, it's always someone else's fault. And that's why we have all these conspiracy theories. theories right? If uh, somebody in Egypt... Um, Years ago, I was uh, talking to an Egyptian, uh, a doctor, and we started to talk about Mo Muhammad Atta, who was a oh, pilot, wow. who, <laughs> sure. right? Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, he, he, he flew uh, the, 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 uh, the plane into, right, into the Twin Towers. Yeah. And we started, and he told me, a very educated man who had gone to medical school, he told me with great sincerity that, uh, no, the Mossad had captured, uh, had, uh, captured uh, Atta, killed him, uh, um, and taken his face off and put it on another terrorist. And so it wasn't Mohammed Atta who committed this horrific crime 
right, of September the 11th, it wasn't an Egyptian, it was somebody else, right? It was a conspiracy by, by Israel. Now, why would he say such a thing? Because you can't admit the shame, right? You can't take the blame. And I'll tell you whether it's Lebanon, Egypt, uh, some places, in Jordan, uh, Iraq, uh, right? You have uh, violence of one community against another, and it's very hard for one community or one person to say, listen, uh, the way we've treated you has been horrible. We're sorry. Forgive us. Right? In contrast, in Judaism, right, on Yom Kippur, uh, they will pray something called the Vidui. This is a general confession. And it is a confession for personal sin, and it's a confession for uh, sin against, especially sin against God. It's in the plural, we. By the way, Kevin, all Jewish prayer, like the Lord's Prayer, the beautiful example of a, of a Jewish prayer, all Jewish prayer is, is in the plural. It's not I, me, me or mine, it's we. And the Vidui says, you know, we have sinned, we have slandered, we have committed murder, uh, we have stolen, and it goes on. It's extremely brutal, right? But it's a, it's a confession, uh, right? The people of Israel are confessing their sins and they're asking God for forgiveness. What's even more important about Yom Kippur, you cannot come to the Yom Kippur service and ask for forgiveness, okay, from God, unless you have done everything possible to make amends and to make reconciliation before Yom Kippur. If you have had a, uh, you might say a spat or uh, an argument with your neighbor and things are tense, before you go to the synagogue, right, and you pray those prayers, you have to make every attempt to be reconciled to your neighbor. If you have um, stolen something, you need to make restitution. And by the way, repentance in Judaism isn't just saying, I'm sorry, but uh, you have to do, for, for example, do something practical. Mm -hmm. So if you've, if you've stolen, if you stole a shekel, you, uh, unless the offended party agrees, you need to repay four shekels, right? Um, if you have not honored the Sabbath, you need to not ask, say, God, forgive me. I won't do it again. You need to stop, start honoring the Sabbath. Right. really reminds yeah. me of the te teaching of Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount. If someone has... If, if uh, someone has an offense against you, go to that person and be reconciled before you offer your, before you offer your, your sacrifice. So, um, but that's, what, very... that's, that's what's unique about young Kabir. You're not just asking forgiveness of God. You're asking that's forgiveness right. of everyone you've wronged. Exactly. You, uh, you, you, you ask right. forgiveness, you ask people to forgive you and then then you go into the service and humble yourself with fasting. Now we're, we're going, we're going back into my brain here. There's also a prayer called Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre is, is is a release of vows, mm -hmm. um, and this is just before the Yom Kippur service. Uh, if you've made a rash vow to God or to someone, I promise to do this and this and this. Uh, but you haven't been able to carry it out. Uh, this is a way of being, you might say, being released, uh, being re released from uh, the vow. Uh, it doesn't mean, contrary to what anti-Semites might say, is that, oh, I promised to pay back uh, a loan of a thousand dollars, but I'm going to now ask God to relieve me of that obligation. Right. It, it doesn't. That's how it works. It doesn't work. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. Now, there's um, also wearing white on Yom Kippur. Wearing white for, yes, wearing white for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it is a 25-hour fast of no food and water. Uh, one needs to uh, afflict one's soul uh, to humble oneself. And uh, at the end of the Yom Kippur service, on the afternoon uh, before 
uh, the the holy day uh, the holy day finishes, the book of Jonah is read in the synagogue. And the book of Jonah assures the believer, right, that if one truly repents, right, God will, uh, God will relent and, uh, you know, and and forgive. And uh, uh, part of the understanding uh, of Yom Kippur and of this holiday that is starting in just a few minutes here, uh, Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, is that, of course, sin brings, can bring divine punishment sin can bring uh, the consequences of sin can bring uh, trouble difficulty disaster yes and so by turning away from sin yes we're asking god to right to to bring us uh, blessing and safety and security and provision uh, provision as well so so uh, i think it uh, uh there is a time to um, especially pray for the people of Israel. I know uh, I, I've heard that the ACNA um, has uh, a call it uh, that churches can opt to pray uh, on Sunday. It, it is a prayer for the people of Israel during uh, uh, the high holy days. And uh, that might, I think that might be, certainly might be a, a be appropriate, but I, I would um, hope that those uh, who have Jewish friends and neighbors, or those who know um, um, maybe their their local rabbi, uh, that um, we, uh, Christians would uh, extend a, a hand of friendship, and uh, without necessarily saying we agree with everything the Israeli government does, that we. Uh, want to express, you know, our empathy with the people of Israel, uh, not only around Yom Kippur, but around uh, the, you know, the uh, commemoration uh, of uh, October the 7th. And um, I think that would be a very appropriate way. And equally appropriate would be um, for all of us to take a very radical, you know, uncompromising stand against anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm in any form. And um, what's so difficult about this is that we have countries like Iran and Russia, Venezuela and Cuba, China, uh, maybe China, but yeah. uh, they are, um, they are uh, poisoning, right, the internet with, uh, with anti Semitism and anti Israel propaganda, and um, just creating a great hostility. Uh, uh, towards uh, the Jewish people, which ultimately, Kevin, is demonic. Okay, it is. But uh, I want to encourage you know a little bit here. This type of conflict has caused Israel itself to unify. Just like you know, September 11th caused um, a great patriotism and, and unification of America. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the, Israel has a chance here to to wake up and. Hey, we're all on the, let's get all get on the same page here. Mm -hmm. You know of who we are, what we are, and what God has us on the earth for. Mm -hmm. um, anybody oh. who remembers the oh. history? It's it's to be a blessing. Uh, I will bless you to be a blessing. But um, in, in a such that it's good to see a little bit of unity in Israel, which for the last uh, dozen years, twenty years, has been in conflict with each other. Yeah, the, this is. Uh... This will this will be a little bit uh, a little bit paradoxical. Mm -hmm. This has indeed indeed uh, created more resilience in Israel. Mm -hmm. And if uh, Mr. Sinwar thought he he was weakening Israel, he hasn't. But in the process of of strengthening uh, uh, solidarity in Israel, there will be a. Uh, Hashbon nefesh. There will be a, a reckoning, okay, uh, politically and culturally after this. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be a lot. There will be a lot of fallout. Uh, it'll look kind of messy, but uh, I'm convinced that uh, this, this is um, this will ultimately strengthen Israel. A few days ago, I was. I uh, don't know if I should give the name. I was with a, an ACNA bishop. And uh, we visited Palestinian Christians and 
up north and we visited Palestinian Christians uh, in Bethlehem. We also uh, visited uh, uh, farms and villages, yes, that uh, suffered from the uh, terror attacks on October the 7th. And what we found uh, were people who were resilient and determined, yes, not to be defeated by terrorism. It was, it was actually quite encouraging, um, very, very encouraging. And they encouraged us, you know, not not to compromise with evil uh, and to, to remain, uh, you might say, uh, straight thinking uh, and to remain uh, ethical or at least to, to, to remain moral by not confusing evil with good and, and you know, good with evil, uh, which of course is the, the curse of the generation in which we live, right? People who wave Hamas flags or who are protesting for, for Hezbollah, you know, they're promoting a death cult. And uh, this is part of the sickness of our age. You know, we, we recently celebrated um, Michael and all the angels, and we read that passage every year from Revelation chapter 12, right? Yeah. And what do we read about the great dragon? The one is that deceives the nations. And we are certainly, uh, there's certainly a flood of deception, yes, uh, in the world today, so. We, yeah, we, we've raised a generation that doesn't know its history. We we raised right. country well, countries who don't know their history, um, and just a little digging. When they discover the history, they want to deny it. And we just, we, we've ra raised a generation that doesn't believe there's such a thing as the truth. Yeah, true. Okay. All right, my friend. We shall one day soon talk again. I actually have an interview scheduled with a certain ACNA bishop for tomorrow. We'll save. Okay, uh, good. We'll, we'll save that okay. for uh, okay, tomorrow's. Well, that's audience. excellent. And now I, w I want to, uh, to just to let you and your audience know because I know you depend on you know uh, viewer support that uh, I have a, fo a phone here with uh, uh, with an app and uh, I'm getting paid or you're going to have to pay me by the word, Kevin. So that's why oh, I spoke no. so much. <laughs> that's why I spoke so much. But Kevin, I, I want and I want you to know that I'm going to give you a discount. Right, no definite articles and prepositions. I mean, I mean, that's those are free. Okay, okay? Uh, no, so I'll yeah. be sending you the bill. No Hebrew I'll words, uh, you know. Uh, you, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll be sending you the bill, and I want you to know that I'll use the money for the Lord. Good, 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 good. <laughs> um, yeah. Church. Yeah, and next time we meet, we'll talk about the economic impact and stuff of what's going on in, in the Middle East and certainly with Israel and uh, with tourism. But um, uh, I think we've, we've given the audience enough to ponder about, pray about. And indeed, I would ask, um, as I will, I will be uh, fasting for Yom Kippur. So, um, well, I, I think, yeah. And, and we're not, uh, I think it, we have to make it clear, we're not fasting for the forgiveness of sins. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fasting uh, as a way to express um, uh, identity and sympathy with the people of Israel and mm -hmm. to pray that uh, God will have his will uh, and uh, God will do his work amongst them. Uh, and that's a good reason to fast and pray on that day. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you for thank you for yeah for the check you're sending. I really am very great. No You've been watching Anglican Unscripted episode eight hundred and eighty three.